it's day 46 from RFF phalloplasty. If you don't know what this is, I am transgender and I have been in transition for over seven years. I've went through a few different surgeries, but the one recently, which I just talked about, is where they take a skin graft from your arm to create a phallus. My arm did not give me any complications. This was actually the easiest part. It didn't quite go as planned. I did stage one, which was the um, graft off of my arm, the scrotoplasty, vaginectomy, um, urethral lengthening, and a skin graft in my leg to uh, fix my arm. Now, with the surgery, there is a lot that goes into it, a lot that, you know, can happen and usually ends up with risk of complications. I had multiple complications, ranging from pulmonary embolisms to a urethral infection to staph, MRSA, septic shock, and ultimately C. diff. The C. diff led me to needing a fecal transplant in order to get my body back in health in order to actually heal from these surgeries. It's been a decade since my sex reassignment surgery. I had my SRS 10 years ago. It's been almost four years since I had the first stage of my vaginoplasty. I had my second SRS revision surgery. I am getting a second surgery. After my surgery, I was just in such a dark place that I didn't really want to talk about it. I didn't really want to have to go back into it and feel all those feelings over again. I had a few complications, bleedings, infections. I've had complications and I've had a hard time. I did have some complications and I did have some, you know, concerns that not everybody deals with. I thought it would make me happier and initially it did. Was that worse the constant issues I've had? The dilation I have to do for the rest of my life? I'm having the worst time with dilation. I was experiencing a little bit of dehiscence, which is basically when you are so swollen that the sutures that they put start to rip open. It was as bad as it sounds. I had trouble urinating. I kind of walked around with it for a year before I seeked help. The reason I'm dilating twice a day is because if I miss once, it is so painful. I like dread it so much because it's so painful. I went to dilate again that night and I think that I moved a stitch. I don't know what happened, but something happened and I was in excruciating. I started the puberty blockers at age 11 and hormones at when I was 12. She's one of the first to have undergone complete pubertal suppression and lack of growth of the skin and other tissues, which we rely on as surgeons to do this operation. I was just not expecting her to have a complication as severe as what she did have. <laughs> the wounds were definitely separating and she formed like a blister. Like that's almost like a blood blister. As we were getting her on the bed, like I, I felt something go pop. And when I looked, the whole thing had just slid open. So the dehiscence on the outside, it was it was bad. She really was under so much tension that it created these large wounds. So we took a, a little bit of a skin graft from the other side of her groin, which we didn't use before. And uh, I just put that in over the open wounds, repacked the vagina, and we covered everything up. And let the skin recover as much as it can. Skin grafts don't always work. And if that happens, then we will probably just do the skin grafts again. Let me just take a, a picture too. Poor thing, you could be a porn star for all the photos <laughs> you're taking. I have some concern that we can get enough mobility of the tissues that we can make the labial structures look convincing. You know, I really thought after this third surgery that everything would be smooth sailing, but now there's this whole hiccup. My pee stream is not quite going out in the right direction. And just recently, I've been experiencing less clitoral sensation. I feel like I've already lost the aesthetics, you know? Hopefully after this revision, it'll look good once it heals. But if I lose some of my sensation and nerve endings, I might never experience an orgasm. Every single child who was, or adolescent, who was truly blocked at Tanner stage two is, has never experienced orgasm. I mean, it's, it's really about zero. And it's because they never in their lives are exposed to testosterone. In the past few months have just been so challenging. 
<laughs> and it's just been such a struggle. <laughs> Two years ago, I was on my way to one of the greatest institutions in the world, but I was actually struggling severely with mental health issues. All right, once it zeroes. I started binge eating and I gained weight and more weight and more weight. And now almost 100 pounds heavier, here I am today. Dilation is a process that comes along with bottom surgery. Basically, you take this long acrylic object and insert it up your vaginal canal so that you maintain depth and width. It's really important that you do this because if you don't, your vagina will start closing up and it'll lose its depth and you won't be able to use it properly. I have woken Jazz out of a dead sleep and taken the dilator and put the lubrication on it and said, here, you take this and you put it in your vagina. If not, I will. Bye. Don't forget to dilate. Oh. Exhausting. It I just know. doesn't stop. It's okay. Give me a hug. It's okay. I know what you're going through. We've been there before. No, it's no, not. I'm the one doing it. Like I know. You're your own worst enemy. And I really want to have that clarity. I really want to understand myself and be able to read my own soul and what I want. And it's just very challenging. And I think I'm kind of breaking down a little bit. And I just want to feel like myself. Like, that's right. it. You're I don't like care. All I want is to be happy and feel like me. And I don't feel like what me ever. Me? because my body has fallen apart in front of me. My joints constantly hurting, my vocal cords aching, watching as parts of me atrophy away before my very eyes. How can you look me in the eyes and tell me that a child can consent to being changed to an experimental medical industry? I began my transition in California. It was when I was a minor that I was first affirmed to adopt a false identity. But now I am 26 years old and I am dealing with genital atrophy, urinary issues, possible sterilization, tremors on half of my body, back pain, memory loss, loss of my eyesight, and many more issues that I may develop as I age. My story is not an outlier or that of a failed transition, but the realization of the truth of this practice. If you look online, you will see many stories like mine. Looking back, I wish there was proper safeguards to protect. So like many children and teens today, I identified myself as transgender for years. Everyone in my life immediately affirmed my new identity, either out of full support for it or just to stay neutral and not cause any issues. But the constant affirmation solidified me in my transgender identity. No one meant to lock me into an identity that would later leave me broken, ashamed, and more confused than before. They were really all just being nice. But the social transition eventually wasn't enough, and I soon felt I needed to take testosterone. And when that wasn't enough, I had a double mastectomy. And when that still wasn't enough, I had a total hysterectomy, including the removal of my uterus, cervix, fallopian tubes, and both ovaries. There's no point of contentment during a gender transition. We get fleeting moments of euphoria, but ultimately one step leads straight into the next. And I thought that in the end I could really become a man, but all I became was a mutilated and abused version of my old self. Social transition is a big deal and we're lying when we say that any of this is reversible. I medically detransitioned this past year, hearing about the process of other detransitioners and even speaking to some people who are here today. It makes you realize that, oh well, maybe this is not so rare as they're saying it is, um, especially when it comes to medical consequences. There was like a list of that, the incontinence, you know, not being able to hold your bladder, um, not being able to sleep because of heat flashes that are painful. Um, it's, it's ridiculous thinking that a teenager should go through that. I know that I had a conversation with Chloe earlier this year about heat flashes, and that was the first time that I had spoken to anybody about like the itchiness and the uncomfortableness at night and realizing that wasn't just me. You know, and that's what you hear a lot. A lot of people will be like, oh, well, it's just you. I guess it just didn't work out for you. It's like, it's not just me. I ended up getting uh, facial feminization surgery. And shortly after that, I got approved for sex reassignment surgery. There was absolutely no pushback by therapists. They completely like ignored comorbidities I had. I have internalized homophobia. They completely didn't even push back at all. They said, they affirmed me, you know, and gave me letters for the surgeries. When I turned 18, I learned that I could obtain testosterone through informed consent. And in my experience talking to them, they kind of downplayed the risks. They really sort of focused more on the 
aesthetic changes that I will go through. I went to Planned Parenthood like a week later. I basically walked in. I said, hi, I think I'm trans. They said, great, we're gonna diagnose you with gender dysphoria and here's your prescription for testosterone. You can get it the very next day. And I said, great. I didn't actually realize in my head what a huge fucking red flag this was. I started off by getting a prescription for testosterone. And to do that, I called up Planned Parenthood because I'd heard they provided gender affirming services. I thought I would have to go through some kind of process to get the testosterone, but instead what happened is I talked on the phone for 30 minutes with a doctor I'd never met in person and I got prescribed testosterone over the phone. In years old, testosterone was being injected into my anorexic body. This was after a single appointment with a WPATH certified therapist who asked me a few questions and told me that I was a boy. These vague questions included things like, do you dislike your period? Do you get along better with boys? I went to a Planned Parenthood a few weeks after my 18th birthday. None of the clinicians were interested in what was behind my desperation to change my body. They told me that because I seemed so sure they would prescribe the hormones that day. I had seeked assistance through my local LGBT center and on my first appointment I was immediately affirmed as a transgender woman. When I asked her uh, why was I affirmed so quickly, she said she did not want to gatekeep me and she had my letter to transition right away. I believed I was non-binary. I struggled with severe mental illness and suicidal ideation. I had a trauma history. Being a girl meant I was vulnerable. This should have been a red flag. Yet within months of requesting top surgery, it was performed on me. I developed complications after my surgery. There are many times I didn't know if I would make it through the night. Presenting and taking on another gender was a way for me to escape womanhood. Escape is not a valid way of dealing with trauma. I had physical health issues that had been previously overlooked. Had that been managed, I would have never gotten the surgery. Between my carved up body and the physical complications, I often question if there's anything on the other side. The goal of healthcare should always be to get to the root cause of the problem. And as a fully medically transitioned transgender adult, I have suffered many life-threatening complications because of it. A dangerous epidemic has started here in the United States and worldwide, medically transitioning children at an alarming rate. In some places, over a 4,000% increase. A process that is mostly experimental, dangerous, and we have no long-term studies to know what's going to happen to these children's health in the future. If you are one of many parents that has children that were harmed with gender ideology, gender medicine, you don't have to be alone. The were profound. I began experiencing uncontrollable episodes of rage and paranoia where I was a danger to myself and others. As a D-trans woman myself, I can tell you absolutely that testosterone will drive you insane. You will have all sorts of thoughts and urges and problems that you will not understand and your doctors will also not understand. And instead of getting you off the medication, no, 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 they'll prescribe you other forms of testosterone, but only the brands that they get kickbacks from. Testosterone also has mental and emotional effects. It can cause mood swings and rage, especially as the dose goes up. But what is interesting is that it also causes euphoria. This is why people who have just started it report feeling better. They're on drugs. At first I was elated, but my mental health did not improve. I became more suicidal, more unstable, and the anxiety became debilitating. Testosterone was never questioned as a contributing factor to my increasing instability. None of the clinicians in the hospital or outpatient centers ever mentioned testosterone as a possible source for my mysterious symptoms. Instead, I was prescribed a litany of psychiatric drugs. This time was so dark that it caused me to question the original promises of a joyful trans life. So I kind of thought, well, maybe I should stop taking testosterone, but I'd had it so conditioned into me by my doctor and the trans community. Oh, you don't just stop. It's really dangerous to just stop. Turns out, yeah, you can just stop. Especially in a situation like that, I really should have, but I continue to take it, but in smaller doses. I transitioned when I was like 25, uh, lived as a man, quote unquote, for like seven years. Um, realized, oh, I don't need to do this and I'm running away from other things. So I went back to living as a woman, more or less, a year ago, and just kind of opened my eyes to kind of like the whole gaslighting. The whole thing is like weaponizing empathy to 
make people believe that oh you have to affirm these kids that's that's the nice thing to do but long term uh well i think you guys know in my early 20s i uh had substance use disorders and mental health issues i transitioned from male to female i lived my life as a transgender woman for close to 10 years i detransitioned upon sobering up and getting uh, to see a psychologist that was not an activist. I think a lot of society, especially the trans rights movement, detransition is a reality that they're not ready to see or face or accept. Yeah, so I'm somebody who transitioned and detransitioned um, while I was still a minor. I started experiencing gender dysphoria when I was about 12 years old and I started socially transitioning by first by changing my name, um, the way I dress, the way I cut my hair and my mannerisms, and then eventually I got diagnosed with gender dysphoria. And at 13, I was put on puberty blockers and testosterone, and I had a double mastectomy at 15, just after my sophomore year of high school. And I stopped transitioning at 16 years old. Well, Chloe, I'm wondering, how was this covered by your insurance program, or did they have to pay out of pocket? Yeah, so I'm from California, and by law, insurance companies are supposed to cover every single step of the transition wow. process pretty much. And, and I'm curious, so they're forced to by law cover the transitions, but what about in your case when you end up figuring out that you didn't need these surgeries and they took advantage, do they also, are they forced to cover the detransition surgeries and treatments? No, so I, ha I really, I've, I've reached out to the, the team of medical professionals who helped me to transition and I haven't gotten any help with my detransition. I've pretty much had to figure out how to go through emotions all by myself. There, there's still a lot of unknowns. I mean, I'm having a lot of complications. So when I was 19, I went to an informed consent clinic, which basically means you just walk in and you say you're trans and you want cross-sex hormones, testosterone. And they gave me a free prescription of testosterone that day, even though I told them all these lists of, you know, being suicidal, all this. Um, they just gave me a very high dose of testosterone. Pretty much had no checks and balances. They just gave me the prescription and that's- Many of us, transition was not the life-saving treatment we were sold. Some of us are standing on the other side and looking back thinking, what the heck did I do to myself? And why did people just go along with it? Some of us are struggling with infertility, some with body image. If you were me and you knew there was a way to prevent something traumatic that happened to you from happening to someone else, wouldn't you advocate for that? Trans women and trans community things that estrogen is just for looks. <laughs> but there's so much more to it, you know, it definitely changes the way you feel, the way you sing. In terms of hormones, there is no studies comparing it to placebo to even you know, get an idea, is it any better than placebo? Usually when you do drug studies, you do compare it to a placebo. But within a year after taking estrogen, I started hating my penis. I got convinced that it was just like, it needs to go, it doesn't belong on my body. I was getting very dysphoric. So I literally went from being okay with my genitals to hating it and wanting it off my body. When I was 16, I thought being a boy was more important to me than having kids. But now at 21, I wonder why I was allowed to make that decision so young. If you or your child has been harmed by gender medicine, transition justice may be able to help. I used to believe if I was born a girl, my life would have been much better. Now after transitioning, I realized my body was never the problem. As a young person who fell prey to the illusion that gender affirming care and transition could help treat my complex PTSD, I'm relieved that there can be some form of justice for the additional medical trauma that I've endured. When gender-affirming care damaged my health and jeopardized my singing career, I felt I had nowhere to turn. But transition justice is helping people like me seek reparations. If you or your child has been harmed by gender-affirming care, transition justice may be able to help. In pain. Everywhere. All of the time. It's a burning feeling. Um, because of the overgrowth at the top of my body that the bottom of my body cannot support. I feel like I'm carrying a heavy weight and I'm hugely disproportionate. My joints all ache all the time. You know how when you take a deep breath, your ribs expand? Well, when I do that, my ribs stay open. I have to put my hands at either of my sides and like close them back in or they just stay like that and it hurts. And I believe that's due to binding. My vocal cords hurt. My 
original voice was very, very high pitched and my singing voice is gone. Were I to be in danger, there's no way for me to scream and even just talking for long periods hurts. I was told that I would have vaginal atrophy, but I didn't know what that meant. Vaginal atrophy involves the shrinking, thinning, and pretty much disintegration of the vagina. Mine is so small that I can no longer use tampons. I did not know that this was going to happen to my body when I gave informed consent. He put out guidelines in 2017, yeah. and they were very careful in the guidelines. One, to point out that the evidence was of low and very low quality. And they also said in the guidelines that they have no idea how you identify which kids are trans and require this treatment. And then the American Academy of Pediatrics the next year just leapt into that void and said, oh, oh, we'll tell you how you know which kids. You ask them. Prior to 2018, I had maybe one trans patient, but then there was another one and another one and another one. It wasn't until later that I started asking questions like, wait, every single kid I send to the gender clinic gets put on puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones. Just, it was happening immediately. The endocrinologist practicing in private practice for the last 16 years. I've been studying uh, and publishing uh, in this area for the last five years, including peer-reviewed journals such as Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism and others. I also have a patient who is a detransitioner. I think it's important to note that studies have shown that desistance or growing out of this condition uh, of children by adulthood is very high, some 50 to 98 percent. I want to be sure before I give someone a very powerful hormone like insulin that they in fact have diabetes. What about cancer? Before we give any powerful agents such as chemotherapeutics or surgeries, we certainly want to have physical evidence uh, of this problem such as biopsies or imaging. Now the gender affirmative therapy treatment proposed by WPATH gives very powerful hormones and surgeries on what basis? Where can we find the gender identity to be certain that these children will not desist by adulthood? Can we use imaging of the brain or blood tests, genetic testing? Are there other biomarkers to ensure that we are correct? There is no such 